very happy to, although I'm not listed, uh, to be moderating this panel. I was uh, as an undergraduate and a student at Thomas Aquinas College, and I'm pretty sure at least some of you taught some of my teachers. So um, without further ado, our first speaker will be Eva Brand from St. John's College. She'll be speaking on the actual intention of Plato's dialogues on justice and statesmanship. Cicero famously said of Socrates that he was the one who brought philosophy down from heaven to earth. This must be some other Socrates than the one of the Platonic Dialogues. Perhaps Xenophon's in the memorabilia. After all, even the comic Socrates of Aristophanes' clouds is a meteorologist, a watcher of the heavens, though he doesn't hoist it up in a basket but up. Of course, of course he is a sky watcher, since that is where are to be seen the clouds, Aristophanes' comic version of the forms, vaporous and loquacious. Perhaps it would have been more accurate to say that Socrates connected earthly matters, such as politics, to the invisible heavens, the realm of forms. There are three Platonic dialogues overtly and extendedly connected with politics. The first, the second longest of all the dialogues, is the Republic in Greek Politeia. It bears the subtitle added in antiquity of, on the just. The second is the statesman in Greek Politikos. Its ancient subtitle was on kingship. And the third, the laws, or nomoi, subtitled on legislation, is by far the longest. In the Republic, Socrates is both narrator and main interlocutor. In the statesman, he is the originating occasion of the dialogue, but not a participant. He sits it out, as in perhaps a time somewhat skeptical auditor. The leading speaker is a visitor, a stranger from Alea, Parmenides' hometown. Finally, the laws don't even take place in Athens, but in Crete, and Socrates doesn't appear at all, though there is an anonymous visitor, a stranger from Athens. Who doubts that the laws is a work of practical politics, in fact, the mother of constitutions? As the Athenian says, our logos is of cities and frameworks and law giving. Perhaps we might even say that the farther Socrates is from a dialogue, the more it is merely earthly. My title for this brief talk, which is the actual intention of the first two of these dialogues, implies that in them all is not as it seems. Here is Rousseau's opinion of the Republic, taken from the first book of the Emile. Those who judge books merely by their titles take this for a treatise on politics but it is the finest treatise on education ever written. And indeed, the central books of the 10 that comprise the Republic are taken up with ontology, the philosophical framework that must underlie education and with that ensuing education itself. To be sure, it is the education of philosopher kings who will found and maintain that best politeia, the civic framework with which the Republic is concerned. And yet, Again, neither this civic framework for the best city, which will be superintended by the philosopher kings, nor its justice is the actually intended topic of the Republic. For recall, this city is devised as a model writ large of the soul, a model from which the more, con from which the more conveniently to read off the nature of individual internal justice. The book we call The Republic rests on two tremendous assumptions. One is that political frameworks, not only the best but even more strikingly the worst, are analogous to enlarged projections of the soul. And the other, even prior one, is that the soul ought to be our first topic of inquiry and is only on the way to it that we discover political ideals psychology, 
absolutely precedes politics, souls make states. Thus it would be a fair argument to say that the particular political justice, which is generally understood to be pecul the peculiar contribution of the republic, is in fact read off a civic construction meant in the first instance to incorporate a notion appropriate to internal psychic justice. For the three castes of the best city are delineated in such a way that the famous definition of justice as doing one's own business, which falls out from the community's constitution, is applicable to the soul as Socrates conceives it. In other words, the just city is built from the first to be an enlarged soul. Let me outline how Socrates makes it work. The castes are functionally defined, each by its own specific task within the city. Moreover, they form a hierarchy of command and responsibility, such that any one caste's, caste's transgression is in fact rebellion, factional strife. Such internal dissension is, however, nearly the worst fate, as any Greek knew or should have learned in the course of the Peloponnesian War, the worst fate that could befall a political community because it is the prelude to tyranny. To reiterate, for Socrates, the maladjusted, dysfunctional soul is the antecedent cause of political evil. It is to me an unresolved problem whether Socrates was in politics the anti-egalitarian he's sometimes accused of having been. In his demeanor, and what matters more, his conversation, he seems as populist as possible not much impressed by smart young aristocrats about to go to the bad, like Critias, Carmides, and Alcibiades. Moreover, in the Republic, he says, of a democracy that, and I quote, it's a handy place for searching out a politeia, a constitution, which happens to be what he himself is doing at that very moment. The solution to the problem depends on how we look at the word Calipolis, fair city that he's found or has made, the name of what he's, the city is found, founded or made. It is, and it's, it, is it and its justice a serious political proposal on par in earnestness with Aristotle's politics in antiquity or Locke's, Montesquieu's, Rousseau's works at the beginning of modernity? In view of the motive for the constitution of Socrates' city, that is a reasonable question. To lend my exposition some specificity, let me give you the briefest reminder of the model city, both as best as, and as paradigmatic for the soul. And let me once more anticipate the result. The human soul, too, will be a hierarchy of functional parts, and it, too, will sport the virtues displayed by the city, now operating in individual human beings, much as they did in the community. At the bottom of the city's castes, then, there are the craftsmen and tradesmen, whose business it is to perform their particular work well and profitably, and to attend just to those assignments and to no other. Beyond that, they're pretty free and prosperous, and thus satisfied. They are without a specific caste virtue other than competence, for they are driven by appetite rather than by character. But they are the class for the particular operation of the most encompassing virtue, justice. Justice is the virtue of the part and the whole, of each part doing its own thing and thereby preserving the integrity of the whole. A temperance is another non-specific virtue, that of agreeableness in the sense that each caste is accepting of its position in the hierarchy. The middle caste consists of the warriors who guard the city, and it is the training ground of kings. This caste is defined by spiritedness, and it is the locus, locus of honor, the source of a soldier's satisfaction through danger. These warriors do have a particular virtue, namely courage. The ruling caste is comprised of the philosopher kings, whose virtue is wisdom, and in whom the intellectual part, thoughtfulness, dominates. Their satisfaction 
is the highest. Their happiness is subject to interruption by the duties of governing. It is, however, alleviated by their affection for the young they teach and by a more selfish fact, namely that the city is essentially set up to protect philosophizing. One of quite a few signs that all is not as it seems in the Republic. There are certainly some odd, even bizarre aspects to be observed in this political device. Its strict hierarchy of command is inverted in respect to prosperity. The lowest caste, the craftsmen, the merchants, are the rich ones. At the end of the books on the construction and deconstruction of the city, we are told outright that it is a model laid up in heaven for anyone to look at who, quote, wishes to found himself. He'll practice its politics only and no other. In other words, we really have all along been participating in soul rather than city construction. But oddest is the notion that the governance of this Calipolis, this fair city, the philosopher kings don't want to rule. Indeed, this reluctance is a criterion of their fitness. In fact, the education is set up so as to cancel political ambition, indeed to capture the love of future kings for another realm, to alienate them from the earthly city. For they are to have a carefully graduated program of learning, elevating them beyond the world of appearances into the world of forms, a pure trans-earthly being. That's why Cicero's dictum that I began with about Socrates bringing philosophy down from the heavens to the earth is so inept. In particular, the study that is the capstone of education, that levers the learner into this world of being and drags him out of the terrestrial slime, is dialectic, of which more in a moment. Now for Socrates, to the astonishment and disgust of practical statesmen like Jefferson, who waited contemptuously, contemptuously through the whimsies and nonsense of this book, the study of super-worldly form, that is of beings, is, the proper, is not the proper foundation for governorship. And this is especially the cause insofar as statesmanship is concerned with the virtues, all the standard four just mentioned. For obviously, to properly locate these in the city, that is in the civic community, it is necessary to know them. But to know them is not a matter of empirical research but of dialectical, that is, ontological inquiry, of the study of beings as beings, of being itself. So the education does, after all, have a political purpose. If we agree that ethics, that is to say the inculcation and preservation of virtue, is what the polis and its politicoi, that is, the civic community and its statesmen, is for, I do not think that any contemporary citizen of ours, attached to our Madisonian tradition, can really agree, nor perhaps wholly disagree, and that is one of the many reasons why the Republic is indispensable to political inquiry, for it raises the question of justice in its original way. Is justice in the sense of the Republic is the proper adjustment of the faculties of the soul, in particular the ready subordination of the lower parts to reason is that the condition for political unity and civic peace? From this question falls out a whole slew of problems. Can we commit ourselves to faculty psychology, such as a Socratic psychic constitution involves? And if so, is the adjustment of the functions and their subordination ordination to reason a persuasive analysis of psychological soundness? And if so, does it follow that the adjustment is a political or even a social task? And if so, can a democracy produce the wise government to accomplish these psychic adjustments to induce virtue? Before going on to the statesman, I want to return to Rousseau. Is the real business of the Republic indeed education rather than politics? Socrates never says so explicitly, nor can he since the program they presented is not just an education for leadership, loosely speaking, but very specifically the education of kings, and as Socrates makes very clear for queens. 
It is an education very specifically geared to the Republic's polis, although it will, amazingly, become the general model of Hayek, that is to say, liberal education, lasting until the middle of the last century. Nevertheless, I think Rousseau is right. Indeed, some aspect of this fair city have indeed been politically and socially realized, that is to say, the equality of men and women, to a large extent, the community of marriage partners and children, and by and large it has remained blessedly a pattern, but by and large it has remained blessedly a pattern laid up in heaven, for it has repulsive aspects. Its educational program, on the other hand, has, as I said, cast loose and become viable even in the democracy, because what is nowadays <clears throat> called its elitism is not an intellectual integral intellectually integral part of it. In fact, the college where my two translation partners and I teach, St. John's College, is a remarkably close incarnation of it, and it revels in its intellectual egalitarianism. That is one more element in an argument that the political justice, that political justice is not the actually intended topic of the Republic. So now to the dialogue called the statesman a conversation to which Socrates only listens. Here, at one point, things become startlingly explicit. Near the middle of the conversation, the stranger makes an announcement under the form of a rhetorical question asked in that throwaway tone that alerts a reader of dialogues to a crucial turn. It concerns the ostensible search for the true statesman. Has it been proposed, he asks, for the sake of this man himself, more than for our becoming more dialectical about our things, about all things. And the answer is plainly for learning to think dialectically. We thought we were learning about governing well. It turns out we are involved in a logical training exercise using a universally applicable technique, dialectic the expertise of diving and of dividing and collecting subjects by terms. Socrates is at once, once more, not a participant in this conversation. And this dialectic is not quite his dialectic. His dialectic was a way by which up students, through being questioned cleverly and answering carefully, had their opinions, that is their mere assumptions about the way things are, demolished and then reconstituted so that they might be let up into a solid knowledge of the true sources of these things. It was, in short, an ascending way of learning. The stranger's dialectic is a method which works the other way around. From a tacitly assumed overview of the whole, the accomplished dialectician makes divisions. When he has arrived at what will later, when his method has turned into the technique of classification, be called the lowest species, he goes back up, making a collection of terms. These add up to a definition. Many of our students begin by thinking that that is what Socrates does when he philosophizes, that he makes definitions. Of course, a collection of terms is not what Socrates looks for when he asks, say, the question, what is justice, but it is a preparation for an answer. Is that definition making, however, what the alien stranger does think of as the profitable end product of the dialectic for which the statesman is only an example? No, nothing so unsubtle, I'll try, as I'll try to show in a minute. Not that this more subtle use of division is likely to have satisfied the Socrates who's sitting in. We three translators of the trans uh, of the statesman, that's uh, Mrs. Uh, Mr. Kovic and myself, Mr. Karkovic and myself, um, express the sense of Socrates' skepticism by our assignment of the last speech of the dialogue. Someone, unspecified, says, most beautiful, you've completed for us the kingly man and the statesman. Now the stranger's interlocutor and the statesman is a young man who is also called Socrates. There's some question among scholars whether the older or the younger Socrates speaks this valedictory line. We thought 
that our Socrates, the older one, couldn't have thought it, and so he didn't say it. Here is what the stranger does with the dialectical art of division. First, the whole dialogue is a composition of divisions. To see its handsome design, that of a tapestry, it is helpful to work through its dialectical episodes and the way they're sewn together, like the pieces of a figured row. The beauties of this dialogue are not imaginatively, imaginatively visual, but logically structural. This text is a texture. But this cloak-like characteristic is not just a stylistic formalism. It signals that this new dialectic is a craft which produces practical results. Its physical exemplification and the great metaphor of the dialogue is weaving, cloak making in particular, and making intertwined, protective, enveloping conversations turned out, out, turns out to be the royal art, the discerning and composing craft of the statesman. This is no transcendentally derived wisdom, but a technical expertise for the subject of the statesman, as contrasted with the Republic, is unambiguously political. It is concerned with human herds. And from the vantage point of the king of crowds, the king of herds, the internal relations, disposing the soul of an individual human being, which are the concern of the Republic, recede. They lie below the royal oversight. And with that distance, diminishes the interest in justice, which was, after all, the right relation of the soul's parts. So justice is indeed no big concern of the statesman, be it of the man or the dialogue named after him. And so the statesman who is thus, not a philosopher king, but an expert ruler, sees each soul from afar as displaying one permanent characteristic, my colleague, Peter Karkavich, will point out the exceedingly interesting consequences for statesmanship of what he discerns and what, as a consequence, true statesmanship must be. It is for all its royal denomination and expertise much closer, I think, to, I, uh, to our idea of politics than is the philosophical rule of the Republic. So then what happens to the stranger's startling claim with which I began my remarks on the statesman. How can the dialogue's real purpose be an exercise in dialectic when it will be shown to be so precise and practical a doctrine about managing multitudes? Well, the statesman is neatly reflexive, so, so to speak, self-reentrant dialogue. For by re relentless dialectical division, the stranger establishes the precise location of the statesman and the whole economy of crafts and sciences, materials and products, regimes and rulers, virtues and vices. And in the course of doing that, he's indeed also giving a lesson in the method of division to young Socrates. It may even be that his teaching actually has more effect on a finer young man who is also present, a second silent listener, one of old Socrates' favorite partners in inquiry, namely Theotetus, the other favorite partner being Glaucon and the Republic. Then here's the denouement. In the art of dialectic, the ability to distinguish perspicaciously and to recognize felicitously, or speaking figuratively, to the craft of setting up a civic framework, a loom upon which the citizenry here the warp and wool are interwoven into, cloak -like, into a cloak-like texture, where this cloak serves as a double figure, representing at once the body politic and its protective cover. This art of weaving is a very precise figure for the true statesman's expertise. On this conclusion, old Socrates may, after all, have smiled, for among the Greeks, Weaving is always a woman's art, and that women might match men as rulers as a teaching of the Republic. So ends the statesman, a dialogue that sets forth a doctrine of governing which requires an expertise for which the dialogue itself is a training.
I'd like us to move through this, our speakers and then save time at the end of the discussion. The next speaker will be Eric Singer from St. John's College, who will speak to us on <coughs> justice in Plato's statesman. Ordinary politicians love to talk about justice and to go on and on about all the just things they have done, are doing, or mean to do in the future. We see it all the time, just turn on the TV, especially in an election year. But what about the genuine article, the true politicos, the statesman who possesses genuine political science and who practices or could practice the genuine political art. What role does justice play in such a man's thinking and doing and speaking? A selective glance at our tradition suggests that it plays a very large role indeed. Consider, for instance, our own founding documents, certainly works of statesmanship of a very high order. The Constitution bluntly proclaims in its preamble that one of its purposes is to, quote, establish justice. And the Declaration declares, among other things, that governments exist for the sake of justice, that, quote, governments are instituted among men to secure, end quote, the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Or consider the Nicomachean ethics, Aristotle's prolegomena to the politics. His treatment of justice is longer by far than his treatment of any other virtue, and second in length only to his two-book treatment of, of friendship a topic that for Aristotle is itself deeply intertwined with matters of justice and political life. Or to move a little closer to our chosen topic, consider The Republic, Plato's most famous book about political affairs. All of book one is devoted to justice, and the inquiry into the goodness of justice that begins in book two is based on the assumption that an investigation of a well-constituted city is bound to come across justice because well-ordered cities, like well-ordered souls, always contain it. In other words, all of these texts suggest a fairly deep connection between politics and justice, and between thinking about justice and thinking about politics. Suppose, then, we turn as novice readers to Plato's Statesman, which purports to be an inquiry into the nature of the Statesman, the politicos, and the nature of his art or science, politike. Given the sketch we have just seen, we might expect the dialogue to contain a series of acute reflections on the relation between justice and the true science of politics. We might even expect the stranger from Elia to take up again the question that Socrates had wanted to pursue further at the end of Book One of the Republic, the Socratic question, what is justice? In fact, we get nothing of the sort. We get a strange, vast myth about the cosmos, we, might get, we get an extended, some might say overextended, account of weaving and its attendant arts. We learn that men as herd animals closely resemble pigs on the one hand and chickens on the other. But we hear next to nothing about justice. To begin with, there's no extended discussion of justice in the statesman, no discussion of what it is or whether it's good or bad or anything else. As a matter of fact, justice words that is, words cognate with the Greek word for justice, turn up only about 30 times in the entire dialogue. Uh, I just note in passing that on any three pages of book one of the Republic, you'll probably find the word 30 times. Um, what's more, only about half those appearances have the moral and political connotations that we ordinarily associate with the word justice. In fact, the Greek word for justice, dikaiosune, the word that is so central to Socrates' inquiry in the Republic and Aristotle's inquiry in the Ethics does not appear in the statesman at all. The word injustice does turn up once, but it refers not to a tendency in citizens that needs to be corrected, but to a disqualification for citizenship altogether. As for the remaining cases in the dialogue where justice words are used with moral or political meaning, most are disappointingly conventional, while the most interesting or promising phrases appear to come out of nowhere. What are we to make of this peculiar state of affairs? Does the relative rarity of justice words in the dialogue point to a deep divergence 
between the stranger's approach to politics and the approach of Socrates? Do considerations of justice simply not play a major role in his thinking about politics? Do his interests lie elsewhere? Or, on the contrary, is the stranger's thinking about politics shaped by a distinct conception of justice, but one that leads him to employ the language of justice sparingly? In the end, I want to suggest that the stranger's thinking about politics is, in fact, profoundly shaped by a certain conception of justice, a peculiar one, to be sure, but perhaps no more peculiar than the one Socrates lays out in the Republic, and perhaps not so very different from it either. But I mean to approach this conclusion in a rather roundabout way, by first considering seriously the possibility that the stranger is just not very interested in justice, and that his lack of interest is reflected in his thinking about the science of politics. My hope is that this indirect approach will force out into the light what is distinctive about his understanding. If the stranger is not interested in justice, what is he interested in? Almost any page of the statesman or the sophist gives us the answer, the arts and sciences, including his own science or art of division. In the Phaedrus, Socrates calls himself a lover of collections and divisions, and elsewhere in the dialogues he makes constant use of analogies with the arts. But the stranger goes much further he seems to see the whole human world as an interconnected array of always multiplying arts, the sorting out of which into their more or less natural divisions is one of the philosopher's prime tasks. Angling and sophistry, louse catching and generalship, doctoring and potion making, all these arts and at least 50 more make their appearance somewhere in the sophist or statesman. The stranger's myth, his cosmic vision, helps us to understand this remarkable proliferation of arts and the stranger's acute interest in them. During the age of Saturn, we enjoyed a carefree, hassle-free life under the care of the gods. With no regimes and no families, we lived on the fruits that sprang spontaneously from trees and bushes, talked with the animals, slept naked on the grass, and woke up every morning feeling just a little bit younger. But that time is long past. This is the age of Zeus. The world has grown harsh. The gods have withdrawn, and we grow old. We have been left to our own devices. And those devices, the first fruits of our new age thinking, are the arts. Men need food. The arts of agriculture and herding and hunting must be developed. Men need shelter from winter cold and summer sun from the animals that no longer like us, and from other men, the arts of wall making and house building, shoe making and armor crafting, rug making and wool working must come on the scene. This list could go on. Along with new needs arise new desires. Every need or desire demands a new art, and every new art demands a new subarray of subordinate arts to provide materials to be worked up and tools to work with. Atop this dizzying array of arts is a kind of art of arts, an uber art, if you will. For man the artisan is also man the herd animal. And the human herd, like all herds, needs to be tended and managed. This art or science of herd management, as applied to the human herd, is statesmanship. Its task is neither simple nor easy. It must rule over the other arts and sciences deciding which ones are to be learned and to what degree. To retain its purity of purpose, it must keep itself separate from the arts most akin to itself, the arts of persuasion and generalship and judging. Under certain circumstances, it must also engage in lawmaking. But its most difficult task has to do with the noblest natures under its sway. Just as nature itself in the form of the other seems to give rise of itself to deception and so to sophistry, as we learn in the sophist, so too human nature left to itself seems to fall asunder into two distinct and opposed temperaments, courageous natures and moderate natures. Left to themselves, these natures tend to isolate themselves from one another and in the end degenerate into self-destructive factions. To combat this most dangerous of threats, the statesman must become a master weaver, a webmaster of the spirit and of the body, too, 
he must find ways to knit together the lives of the no city's noblest natures. For only thus can the city become and remain a self-bound, self-sufficient whole. This would seem to be a good place to ask what place, if any, justice has in this picture of politics and political life. <coughs> Sorry. The obvious answer seems to be a place that is important, but rather small and decidedly subordinate. Human herd management would seem to differ from other forms of herd management in this. All herding involves giving commands, but members of the human herd, especially in the age of Zeus, seem to need explicit commands or prescriptions, explicit rules to govern their communal life. These rules, which allow men in cities to get along with one another, constitute justice. <coughs> now, from the point of view of citizens, especially artisan citizens going about their daily commerce-driven lives, such rules, we call them laws, might seem to be the most important manifestation of the political art. But they are, from the point of view of the stranger, only an imperfect and secondary manifestation of that art, in part because they are riddled with imprecision, and in part because, as we've already seen, the first business and real work of the political art lies in the weaving together of courage and moderation. It would be a mistake, according to this account, to think of justice as a virtue, just as it would be a mistake to think of justice as something high, a criterion that the political art has to look up to as it goes about its business. Justice is nothing high or deep or fancy. It is nothing but the set of rules invented by the statesmen that allow us to lead reasonably decent lives in an unfriendly world. Is this account of justice in the statesmen adequate? Does it, as we say, do justice to the stranger's view of justice. There are certainly a number of passages in the dialogue that lend credence to it. For instance, at one point, the stranger makes it very clear that the power of the judge is separate from and subordinate to the art of the statesman. And then he asks if the judge, quote, has any power more far-reaching than, in matters pertaining to contracts, that of discerning the things ordained as both just and unjust by keeping in sight whatever is laid down as lawful and which it receives from a lawgiver king. It looks here as if justice is simply identical to the legal as defined by the law-giving king, that is, the statesman. This language of contracts also turns up a bit earlier in the course of the stranger's critique of law and its lack of precision when he speaks of supervising the herds with respect to the just and their contracts with each other. Once again, justice seems to be equated with the contractual obligations defined by the law. And the baseness involved in dealing with matters of justice, its distance from real statesmanly activity, is underscored by the reintroduction into the dialogue of the language of herds. The text of the statesman also lends support to the thought that justice is not a virtue. There is no place in the dialogue where the stranger states or even implies that it is the statesman at in task to instill justice or anything resembling justice in the soul of his citizens. The closest we get is the suggestion very near the end of the dialogue that moderate natures tend to be more just than courageous ones. But this does not seem to be a matter of education. And in any case, just in this context seems to mean cautious and therefore inclined to follow the law. The meaning of just here is perfectly compatible with passages, other passages, that identify the just with the legal. It simply means a tendency to be law-abiding. Are we to include, uh, conclude, then, that justice has no meaning in the statesman other than a set of rules laid down by the statesman in his lawmaking capacity and then turned over to a subordinate power? We might draw this conclusion were it not for a handful of odd passages where the stranger seems to be pointing us in a different direction. Let me briefly go over three of them. In the first, the stranger argues that rulers in the correct regime can do anything, including banishing and even killing inhabitants, quote, so long as they make it better from worse and preserve it as far as they're able by using science and the just. In the second, which comes just as he is beginning his critique of law, 
The stranger notes that law, quote, could never by having comprehended what's most excellent and most just command what's best, end quote. In the third, the stranger claims that, quote, there is no error for thoughtful rulers, whatever they do, as long as they guard one great thing, and by at all times distributing to those in the city what's most just with intellect and art, both are able to preserve them and make better men from worse as much as possible, end quote. These passages share several features in common. In all, the just is linked to, the just is linked to and subordinated to the good, either of the citizens or the city. In addition, the just is paired with, or at least linked to, thought in some form. Science in the first passage, comprehension in the second, and intellect and art in the third. Finally, in all three cases, and most importantly for the issue we are considering, the just, the just in these three passages simply cannot be identified with what is lawful or what is defined or produced by the law. According to the second passage, the just cannot be comprehended by the law, while in the first, the just seems to function as a criterion or standard at least co-equal with science. Clearly then, justice or the just has more than one meaning in the statesman and in the stranger's mind. But what exactly does it mean in the second set of passages? For instance, what does it mean in the peculiar phrase, science and the just? We can't look to the immediate context of the phrase for an answer. In all three passages, the language of justice just seems to come out of nowhere. To answer this question, we need to take a step back. I mentioned earlier that there are a number of places in the statesman where the language of justice is used with a meaning that is non-moral and non-political. Let me add that with one exception, which I'll get to later, every appearance of this language before the science and the just passage falls into this category. Now in all of these earlier appearances, just and justly have a specific meaning and specific range. They are used to characterize speech or thought, and they refer to correctness or precision or aptness of thought or speech. As when we say in English, as I did a little while ago, that we want to do justice to someone's thought, uh, or that someone has gotten something just right. Now it is precisely this meaning of justice that I think we must import and are meant to import into the passages in question. The intellectual quality that the stranger prizes most in his own science of division, the ability to divide well, to find a part that is also a form, is also the quality that defines or gives meaning to justice in this second sense. Thus, when the stranger says that rulers in the correct regime must employ science and the just, the just is not being introduced here as an extraneous criterion that comes out of nowhere. It rather refers to the exactness or precision of application that is implicit in the very notion of science or knowledge, in this case, the science of statesmanship. Or again, when the stranger faults the law for failing to comprehend what's most excellent and most just, he is simply faulting the law's characteristic lack of precision. Because laws are as such universal, they cannot help but fail to miss what is best here and now, and thus be inexact in their attainment of it, therefore unjust. It should come as no surprise, then, that the stranger keeps referring to the correct or most correct regime, where we would probably say best regime. The best regime is, for him, precisely the regime in which precision or correctness is the ruling principle. There is another way to formulate this thought in the language of the dialogue. At the very center of the statesman, there is an extended discussion of the art of measurement. And at the very center of it, the stranger introduces, without much explanation, the phrase, the precise itself. Why? It turns out that the very existence of statesmanship, in fact, the very existence of all the arts that generate something, rests on the existence of something called due measure. All the arts aim to achieve or produce some good, 
Sometimes they miss the mark, they fall short, or they exceed their aims. But when they achieve, achieve the goods they aim at, they achieve what the stranger calls due measure. And when they do achieve due measure, when they get things just right, at that moment, the precise itself is present. But what holds for the other arts holds for statesmanship as well. Whenever the statesman, aiming at the preservation or improvement of his city or its citizens, achieves this good, he achieves due measure. And in achieving due measure, he participates in the precise itself. But if I am right in thinking that in at least a select number of passages in the dialogue, the just coincides with what is correct or precise, then at such a moment, the statesman can also be said to have achieved justice. To achieve the good is to achieve justice. This brings me to my final point. I want to bring what I have just said to bear on the most important activity of statesmanship, the weaving together of courage and moderation that I mentioned earlier. I mentioned a little while ago that there is one passage early on in the dialogue where the language of justice is not used to refer to precision of thought, only one passage. It occurs in the myth. Interestingly enough, precision also turns up here. But in this place, uh, precision refers to the movement of the cosmos. The claim is that when the cosmos is first allowed to move on, on its own, it moves with precision. But over time, because of the bodily aspect of the cosmos, it gradually winds down. The stranger will say, everything beautiful in the cosmos comes from its composer, while everything, quote, harsh and unjust has its source in this fellow nursling of primeval nature, end quote. Of course, this is a myth, and we have to be careful about what we extract from it. But I cannot help but think that the stranger is here positing something like a primal principle of disorder, a principle that is always at war with beauty, with precision of movement, with the very notion of a cosmos that is an ordered whole. That he associates this principle with harshness and injustice suggests that this principle is at work in the human world as well. The city is an attempt to found something like a human cosmos in the face of primal disorder, primal imprecision, Im imprecision primal injustice. The ordinary arts that ground ordinary life within cities are one aspect of this cosmos formation. Each is, an, each is an attempt to bring forth due measure within some specific context. Each is an attempt to wrestle with its material's resistance to being given proper form. But the greatest of such attempts is the effort of the statesman to bring forth due measure in and through his weaving together of courage and moderation. Justice in the primary sense, then, is not to be found in lawmaking or judging in accordance with the law, nor is it to be found in the accomplishing of this or that good thing for the city. It is found right here in the overcoming of primal injustice, primal resistance to having a community at all. We might think of it in this way. In the sophist, the stranger suggests that being might be not rest, not motion, and not some third thing either. Being is the belonging together of rest and motion. But within the sphere of politics, courage corresponds to motion and rest to moderation. Where then and what is justice? It is not something present in the soul of the courageous man, nor is it something present in the soul of moderate man, nor is it some third thing hovering over the two. Instead, Justice in the primary sense is present whenever the statesman, by thinking precisely at achieving due measure, keeps the primal dyad from falling asunder. Justice is there in and as the belonging together, the being woven together of courage and moderation. Peter Kalkavich from St. John's College to talk to us on peace mix and warm honors, this disunity of virtue in the United States. I want to begin by saying how my theme is related to justice. Plato and Aristotle 
often connect justice, rightly I think, with wholeness. And it is wholeness, the whole of virtue, and the whole of what we call a city, that is very much at issue and at risk in Plato's statesman. Perhaps at risk as well is the wholeness of logos, or discourse. Plato's mysterious stranger from Elia delights in division. In the sophist, he uses the method of dividing genera or kinds to pin down the elusive professor of wisdom. In the statesman, he uses the same method with some modifications to show the genuine statesman and king naked and alone by himself. But the stranger isn't all about logic. Like Socrates, he enjoys images of all sorts and regularly avails himself of their curious power to illuminate. In The Statesman, soon after the great myth about reversed becoming, the stranger announces the need for uh, paradigms in inquiry. He tells young Socrates that they would do well in their search if they came up with a paradigm that would, in its small and humble way, help to reveal the magisterial form, the eidos, of the true king. This paradigm, as we soon hear, is weaving. Politics is the master art that weaves together all the other arts in the city and bends them to its high purpose. But it is not until late in the dialogue, almost at the end, that the precise meaning of the paradigm is explained. The true statesman, we discover, knows how to interweave courageous and moderate types of souls. To use the language of the paradigm, he combines the warp, or hard woolen threads, which resemble courageous natures, with the woof, or soft threads, which resemble moderate ones. Properly combined, these human threads produce the web of statesmanly action. This web is the wisely constituted polis, the beautiful end of politics conceived as a productive art. But the path to this beautiful end requires an account of virtue that the stranger calls somewhat astonishing. Astonishing because it proceeds from the view that virtue is not a happy unity in which different portions of virtue are friendly to one another, as the many say, and as Socrates suggests in other dialogues. On the contrary, virtue has within it and seems even to be defined by a war between courage and moderation. The stranger is unsparing in his formulation. The two virtues, he says, have a deep-seated enmity toward one another and maintain an oppositional faction in many of the things that are. The stranger, we must note, does not ask Socrates' question, what is virtue? Instead, he posits an opposition between two forms of virtue. This opposition, more than anything else in the dialogue, defines the political art. To illustrate his point, the stranger urges young Socrates to consider the two forms, a day, that come to light in everyday discourse when we praise things for their beauty. Various doings and makings, whether of bodies or of souls. We praise things that manifest keenness and swiftness. These can be the things themselves or their images. The swift movement of a runner, for example, or a vase painting depicting such a runner. The name for what underlies and grounds these acts of praise is Andrea, courage or manliness. This is the form we are admiring when we praise the keen and the swift. But we also praise what the stranger calls the gentle form of generation. We praise as beautiful those actions and thoughts that are quiet, modulated, slow, and careful. The name for this form is orderliness or composure, cosmiotes, apparently a synonym for moderation. It refers to the virtue of keeping things measured and undisturbed. We think of things like a smooth transition in a piece of music or a soothing tone of voice. To sum up, our praise of beauty is thoroughly contradictory. We praise as beautiful those things that have a manly look, and we also praise the look that is opposed to manliness. Furthermore, we blame as ugly both what is opposed to manliness and what is opposed to the opposite of manliness, that is, what is opposed to moderation. We do all this, we must note, 
not because we are inept, but because beauty itself is self-opposed, one is temp tempted to say, tragic. Shifting now from things that display opposed virtues to the very natures of courage and moderation, the stranger refers to these as looks, ideas, destined to be split apart in hostile faction. He then turns to the people who have these looks in their souls, not by choice, but by nature. Faction here is described as a feud between warring families. Members of each family judge the beautiful and the good solely in terms of their family virtue and hate members of the other family simply because they are the other family. This love of same and hate of other blinds each family to the common, if problematic, eidos of virtue that both families share. Each family, by virtue of its virtue, is blind to the virtue and beauty of the other. As a consequence, members of neither family really know their own virtue. They do not know why and in what manner their characteristic virtue is beautiful and good. Because of this blindness and the mutual hate it engenders, the two families, even though they live in cities, may be said to occupy, in Hobbes' phrase, a pre-political state of nature with respect to virtue. As if the situation weren't bad enough, the stranger goes on to say that the family feud between the, the noble types is child's play compared with the disease that is the most hateful of all for cities. It is here that the stranger shows why the two forms of virtue and the two opposed types of soul constitute the central problem of politics. Indeed, he demonstrates the urgent need of the political art in the reign of Zeus, the era in which the world has been abandoned by its divine shepherd and guide. Our noble individuals are now citizens and rulers whose one-sided ethos exerts a powerful effect on their cities. The stranger gives a devastating portrait of what happens to cities that fall prey to the ethos of peace at any cost. He refers paradoxically to the eros for composure, the only appearance of this word in the dialogue, as if to say, look at these people, young Socrates. To themselves they seem all calm and reserved, but in fact they have a dis disordered desire for order, why they are as crazy as a man in love. Perhaps there is also the suggestion that eros is to be associated with what is soft and tender, rather than with the tough eros that Diotima talks about in the symposium. In any case, because of their eros for order, these people slip unwittingly into an unwarlike condition and raise their children to be similarly unwarlike. The condition spreads through the city like an infection and becomes more virulent with each generation. Since unmixed moderation cannot accommodate itself to the aggression of an enemy, cannot rouse citizens to display a decisive and manly spirit when this is needed, the city eventually loses its freedom and becomes enslaved. The same result awaits the macho city that wants war at any cost and is driven by thumos, spiritedness, rather than eros. The rage for courage leads citizens and rulers to be constantly tensing up their cities for opportunities to display what they wrongly take to be the whole of virtue. Before too long, the city that idolizes courage eventually picks a fight with the wrong adversary, an enemy it can't vanquish, and so is vanquished in turn. Like the peace-loving city, the war-driven city ends in destruction and slavery. Now we normally think of faction, stasis, as the strife between two parties within a single city. But the stranger's view in the present context is very different. The political problem par excellence is for him not violent heterogeneity. For example, champions of oligarchy versus champions of democracy, but virtuous homogeneity, the idolatry of one of two opposed virtues, whether courage or moderation. To be sure, there is faction in its usual sense within the form of virtue. This may be called the eidetic situation, known only to the philosophic or dialectical statesman. 
But the real life problem occurs when the two naturally opposed virtues are not simultaneously present. Hence, as the stranger sees it, the devastating political principle, the devastating political outcome of the principle likes attract and opposites repel is enacted on the stage of interpolis relations, when a city suffers destruction at the hands of another city rather than from internal discord. The stranger is surely not unaware of the evils of faction in this latter sense, the horrors, for example, that Thucydides describes in the case of Corsaira. But for the stranger, this is not the central political problem, which has its source in the eidetic opposition between the beautifully tough and the beautifully gentle that pervades many of the things that are. The problem, in short, is not vice or human nature simply or intense disagreement over which regime is best, but virtue, which is by nature turned against itself. We might try to make sense of the stranger's critique by citing Aristotle's distinction in the ethics between natural and ethical virtue, the latter being guided by the intellectual virtue of phronesis, or practical wisdom, which allows virtuous individuals to avoid excess and perceive the mean. This is helpful to an extent, but it takes the sting out of the stranger's insight into why virtue is a problem. The stranger would no doubt agree with Aristotle that virtuous dispositions are dangerous. They need phronesis in order to be reliable virtues. But far more important to the stranger is the primordial dyad of courage and moderation, the dyad that defines the task of the political art. That task is not how to interweave a multiplicity of virtues in order to make them one, but how to unite two naturally opposed virtues so that they may complement rather than repel one another and contribute their distinctive powers to the political web. These powers are toughness and flexibility, quickness and caution, forcefulness and grace. It is tempting to say that for the stranger, the problem of politics is that of knowing how to interweave the male and the female forms of ethical beauty. It is true that each virtue, by the stranger's account, must apply to both men and women. How else could one trait come to dominate a city's population through marriage and procreation? Nevertheless, the manliness of courage strongly suggests, as its correlate, the femininity of moderation. This makes it highly interesting that the paradigm for political wisdom in the dialogue is the feminine art of weaving. This may be Plato's way of showing that of the two opposed virtues, moderation, as the love of order and peace, is closer than courage to justice and wisdom. It may also show Plato's philosophic preference for music over gymnastic, since weaving engages in deft material harmonization. In good statesmanship, as in philosophy, grace trumps force to become the greatest force of all. This is true even for our tough-minded, methodically rigorous stranger who tells young Socrates that the statesman and good lawgiver knows how to instill right opinions in others by the muse of kingship. The stranger proceeds to outline the education and nurture that will, that will generate the needful thing, the artful synthesis of virtuous opposites in a coherent political whole. This whole, this web, in order to be beautiful, requires beautiful threads that have been previously prepared by means of a subsidiary art. Statesmanship, like all compositional art, is elitist. Only the best materials will do. And so, there must be an artful way to determine who is fit for an ethical political education and who is not. This consists in observing children at play in order to see which ones show signs of a virtuous disposition whether of courage or moderation. The stranger lays special emphasis on those who prove to be ineducable. He describes them as violently driven off course by a bad nature into godlessness and arrogance and injustice. The political art, here seen in its harsh and decisive aspect, casts them out by punishing them with death penalties and exiles and the greatest dishonors. 
And those who wallow in ignorance and much baseness are put into the class of slaves. The stranger at this point explicitly connects the union of manly and moderate natures with the intertwining of warp and woof, in effect closing the paradigm web he began to weave in the earlier, in the earlier parts of the dialogue. The city, in order to be a durable garment suited to the protection of all those it embraces, needs both kinds of human threads, the hard and the soft. This unity of opposites requires a two-tiered system of civic education that produces two sorts of bonds, one higher, one lower. The higher bond is said to be divine since it applies to the part of the soul that is eternal born, the part that thinks and holds opinions. The lower human bond is marriage, which applies to the animal born part, as the stranger calls it. That is, the part of the soul that has to do with bodily desire. The bonds are produced successively, first the higher, then the lower. Once the higher bond of right opinion is in place, the stranger asserts, the lower one isn't difficult to bring about. This optimism presupposes that the divine bond is strong enough to overcome the greatest of all human drives, the erotic attraction that human beings have for one another, apart from whether they want to get married, and which connects human beings, as we hear in the symposium, with the striving for immortality. The higher tier of the educational process aims at inculcating genuinely true and also steadfast opinions about beautiful and just and good things. These opinions are implanted in both types of noble individuals. In other words, the inculcation of one opinion about what's beautiful and just and good supersedes the idolatry of a single virtue and overcomes the natural impulse to welcome one's like and shun one's unlike. Moderate and courageous individuals will share the opinion that it is good for the city that they mingle and bad if they don't. In other words, they will learn to respect, if not love, a virtue higher than either courage or moderation, the virtue of justice. They will believe that they and their respective virtues are threads that must be woven together to form the political web. I note in passing that the education the stranger describes is based entirely on the cultivation of habits and right opinion. There is no philosophic education for guardians, no turning of the soul from becoming to being, as there is in the Republic. The stranger's version of a city in speech may be the work of a philosophic statesman, but it does not appear that this statesman, though possessing kingly science, is in fact a king in this city. At least, he doesn't need to be. The stranger dwells on how the higher sort of education, which aims at the divine bond, tempers the excess in the two opposed virtues. If a manly individual takes hold of true opinions about what is good and beautiful and just, he will grow tame and in this way be most willing to commune with just things. Without these opinions, he will degenerate into a beast. Similarly, the order-loving individual who holds these same true opinions will become genuinely moderate and intelligent, and the one who doesn't will rightly be called simple-minded or foolish. The establishment of these true opinions takes place through laws and customs that apply only to those naturally suited for an ethical education. This education, as the stranger asserts, is the drug prescribed by the ever-vigilant art of politics. It is the antidote for one-sided virtue. At last we reach the stranger's account of marriage, the human bond implanted by the political art. This bond though lower than the other, is crucial since the city's continuance and well-being depend on procreation through sexual union. We should recall that it is not courage and moderation per se that bring about political downfall, but rather the gradual build-up and concentration of a single virtue through sexual generation over the course of time. As the stranger approaches his culminating definition, he gets down to the nitty-gritty of why people marry. He dismisses those who marry for wealth or power and focuses on those whose care is family and children. These are the people who marry or who arrange the marriages of their sons and daughters for the serious wrong reason by choosing partners who are of their own family when it comes to virtue. 
the political arts, counteracts this error, goes against nature by compelling members of each family to overcome their natural repugnance for other and to marry against type. This will prevent the spread of a single trait by producing hybrids that combine both virtuous types. The stranger does not say what home life will be like for married opposites, nor does he care. The only thing that matters from a political standpoint is that the virtues are mixed rather than kept separate. Of course, Genesis in the reign of Zeus is unpredictable. There will always be children whose nature resembles that of, say, a courageous mother rather than a moderate father. And so the political art must exercise perpetual vigil vigilance and continually oversee marriage and sexual union. The war on nature must go on. The needful union of opposed virtues must be enforced at the highest level of the city, that of the rulers. The stranger acknowledges that it is possible for one individual to have both virtues, though interestingly he does not dwell on that point. The monarchic city must choose this sort of individual as its supervisor. If more than one ruler is required, if the city is aristocratic, then the ruling class must have both kinds of virtuous individuals. The reason is that moderate rulers are cautious, just, and conservative, but they lack, the stranger says, the needful acuity and vigor, which would be supplied by the courageous among the ruling class. The stranger ends his astonishing account of virtue on a cautionary note. Quote, and it's impossible for all things having to do with cities to turn out beautifully in private and in public when these characters, courage and moderation, aren't present as a pair, end quote. Only one thing remains, the final definition of the web that is produced by the true statesman's knowledge. Will this web, as the stranger glowingly describes it, ever be woven, indeed, as it is in speech? From the stranger's perspective, it does not matter. The goal was to define statesmanship solely in terms of what the statesman knows, apart from whether he actually rules, founds, reforms, or advises. What, then, does the statesman know? Not, it seems, how to lead individuals to virtue, but how to temper the virtue they already have by nature. The statesman's wisdom is the wisdom of defense. That is why the stranger dwells more on bad things to be avoided and feared than on good things to be sought and aspired to. Politics is a defensive art. It is embodied in the web that ends the dialogue. Strange to say, when we finally find the statesman naked and alone, he turns out to be a maker of garments, which earlier in the dialogue were placed in the class of defenses. He is the maker of the web that is both the body politic and the political cloak that defends the otherwise naked city from its enemies, the virtuous from their monomania and wrong marriages, and all its inhabitants from exposure and need. Perhaps most of all, the political web protects the city from the ravages of time. A good garment is one that wears well. It must protect us from seasonal extremes. So too, the all-purpose political garment, which must defend the city during the winter of war and its discontents, and during the summer of peace, prosperity, and inattention. Viewed in this light, the web of statesmanly action is a spatial image with a temporal meaning. In Plato's Statesman, politics appears in its true light only when it is seen in the context of the stranger's cosmic myth about the reign of Kronos and the reign of Zeus. The myth compels us to judge the tension-riddled life we now have by contrasting it with a peaceful life that had no sex and needed neither politics nor clothes. The myth discloses, according to Plato's stranger, what is most needful for beleaguered humanity in this, our reign of Zeus, the era that depends on the godlike statesman and shepherd because it can no longer depend on a kindly nature and a caretaking god. I suspect that the world for the stranger is, like virtue, fundamentally incoherent. That is why we need method and art to make order where there is no order or where order is constantly threatened. In The Statesman, one of Plato's experiments in post-Socratic philosophy, 
Plato tempts us to consider the grounds and implications of this modern sounding view. Thank you. We're technically speaking at time, but if our speakers are agreeable, maybe we could linger for one or two questions. Yeah. Uh, just to touch on something Mr. Cat said, but I recommend that I'm having the talk to the entire panel on this. Aristotle's politics at the end of it uh, recommends that the mode for the ruler, the wooden ruler, the most important education is that of music. Never really tells us why, or at least we don't get to find out why, because it's incomplete. It's the greatest cliffhanger in the ancient world. But as you said, weaving music can be seen as a weaving together of notes of a complex and harmonious yes. whole. You think based on this, Paleo would endorse this notion of music as the most important education for the ruler? With the stranger? With the stranger. It's curious that he the views of kingship, and there's some other references to music in the dialogue. But he never makes it a feature of education. I mean, there really isn't a music and gymnastic education either. I mean, not only is there not a, a, a prelude to the song itself of dialectic, but there isn't that. I suspect Aristotle is more interested in individual souls and the power of music has to shape them. Uh, and it's interesting how he shapes them with Aristotle's discussion of imitation. But somehow, in the tones and the different modes, there's something like character. Now, that, that suggests to me that there's something that Aristotle thinks is possible to shape character, not merely to negotiate conflicting elements within character, but to shape it to the good. I think that would be a, a difference. The stranger seems more interested in the danger you have when there, when there's this, when there is this uh, 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 emphasis on one as opposed to the other. So you're artificial. You have to use breeding. You know, to make sure that the kids are uh, uh, are not uh, concentrating the virtue. Aristotle's approach, if I if I may put it this way, I think is a more musical approach to politics. <laughs> I think therefore more preferable. Yes, I'd like to ask Peter. Uh, very interesting. In this uh, how does it apply to our situation in America? <laughs> One-sidedness is always a problem in politics, <laughs> so there, that's a, that's a, that's in a way an easy. Well, I can one. see the evils, but what would we go forward? I think the first thing is, and I got this out of listening to some of the speeches. I, it seemed to me there was a recurring theme in a lot, if not all, of the speeches I've heard at the conference, and which touches on some of the things that we've talked about, and certainly I tried to get at. Aristotle says this in the metaphysics, if you don't understand the problem, there's no hope for a solution. Now, it seems to me that's where the statesman can really help. I don't know about the present situation with courage and moderation. I think it might be too facile to connect it with the proponents of peace and the proponents of war, because the political reasons for that are very different from what the, str I think, from what the stranger is imagining. Nevertheless, it's, uh, I think the statesman, uh, all the dialogues, but the statesman has its own way of initiating us into problems. And I think uh, the faction within something that ought to be whole. He talks much about education, but we do come into that. On? The statesman talks about the importance of education. Yeah, the education, yeah, I, I, the, the kind of education he's talking about is really uh, the inculcation of right opinion, not the opening up of the soul to inquiry. So that, that would be, I think, a, a strong... Yeah, maybe, How that applies to today, I, don't, yeah, I, 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 I wouldn't presume to know. Sorry. So maybe one more question. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, and I, I'm kind of sensitized to the, the uses of the, the, t the notion of techne in a lot of the dialogues, the craft business. And in the statesman, it seems like that notion plays an important part in the myth, right? Huge. Because now when the gods are gone, now what they used to do, we do by craft. And then the final division, or the final division of statesmanship, places it on a continuum of crafts. So I just want to ask a big, wide open question. Why is that significant? It's a great question. I, don't know. I guess I would say, I mean, I, my, my first inclination is to say that yeah, crafts become important because the world is unfriendly, and even statesmanship has to be treated as a craft because of this problem of courage and moderation. There are kind of intractability in materials. How do you think about 
what it would be like to respond to something like that. Well, the notion of a craft that deals with that. Is there, is there anything about the fact that the materials themselves, though, in this kind of craft, the political craft, are personal, <laughs> are themselves craftsmen? We call that the Republic all the intractable elements are let out of the city. So we have purified it of difficulties to begin with. Another aspect of your question, that's a great question that I like to think about all the time. Uh, the extent to which one could understand logos as a technique, speech itself, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's another aspect of the problem. Because that's, that's out front center. You know, it's not less, much less is made of discourse itself, philosophy, as an art. But we get that in the sophists and statesmen. Those two very, put very close together. So let's thank our speakers.